you know, our ancient ancestors are, are out in the savannah looking for food, right? And so our, our brains don't have enough space to just to remember everything. So imagine our brain being like a camera and we don't just go out and take pictures of everything because we run out of space quickly. We have to selectively take pictures and our brains do the same thing. They only lay down memory when it's important. Welcome back to another edition of COVID-19 from Crisis to Creation here on Mentory TV. I'm Patricia falco Becali, your host. And let me say thank you, first of all, for all of you that subscribe, join our community here on Mentory TV, and also hit the bell button so I can always keep you informed. Thank you also for your comments, your sharing, and your liking. You're awesome. So what are we going to talk about today? We are going to talk about another kind of pandemic. There's more and more experts that are here that say apart from the COVID-19 crisis and pandemic, we have an anxiety pandemic really rolling over the globe. If you look at the latest data from the CDC about anxiety, anxiety disorder, depression, and also suicidal ideation, they skyrocketed. Uh, for example, anxiety is up threefold over the last 12 months, also due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So the question really is, what is anxiety? What can we all do to not make that into, let's say, a, a worry or even something that pushes us towards depression or just reaching out for the wrong stuff and creating a long-term problem? And this is why I invited Dr. Judson Brewer. He's the absolute expert when it comes to drug use, abuse in general, also mental disorders such as anxiety. His book, the new book, Unwinding Anxiety, is coming out in a week's time on the 9th of March uh, 2021, and he's here to discuss exactly that. Dr. Judd, thank you so much for being with us here on Mentory TV. Thanks for having me. God, it's so great to see you. you're nice, you're tanned, so I can tell <laughs> that a certain pandemic is certainly not an issue for you right now. But let me first of all ask you, you know, that interest, I've been following you for years um, because it is something that is so of interest. Anything that is to do with our brain and our behavior fascinates me, what drives what and the power of thoughts. And I wonder, what was your fascination to actually start your career, go into psychology, psychiatry, and also then particularly look into the habit creation, bad habits, and addiction? <laughs> well, when I started medical school, I had no interest in any of this. <laughs> you know, I didn't even know how my own mind worked. So it, it turned out that the first day of medical school for me was the first day I started meditating. I had gone through a bad relationship breakup just before starting medical school. I was stressed out, was having trouble sleeping. So I started meditating. You know, I figured it was a new start for me in medical school. And I figured I would just do this personally, see if it would help. <laughs> it certainly helped me a lot. It helped me with the stress of medical school. And importantly, over the next eight or so years of my MD PhD program, I learned how much I had no idea how my own mind worked. And from there, I just, you know, as I was just learning about how my own mind worked, I realized that I actually wanted to become a psychiatrist. It was the last thing I thought I wanted to do. I, you know, and, and so there, it was this combination where I could, I was just starting to learn how my own mind worked. I was starting to see how there were links between this and psychiatry. And importantly, I was seeing how a lot of my patients, especially folks with addictions, were really suffering. They were marginalized. They beat themselves up. Um, you know, there were a lot of, you know, they were real underdogs. And I'm a big fan of underdogs. I want to help the underdogs. Well... Uh, so yeah, that's yeah. that's how it all started. Yeah. So it was really your your fascination and your own your own situation. You said, okay, I want to change something that seems to bother me. So there is stress, anxiety, and this is what it all triggers. So why don't we, before we go into anxiety, go into the entire science of how the brain works? Because I think that is the underlying misunderstanding or lack of understanding amongst most people that they do something and they say, well, what did I just do? Why did I do that? Where did that come from? And so perhaps laying the land a little bit, how our brain really works and what drives our behavior might be a good idea. Yes, I'd be happy to talk about this. And I laid this out a lot in the, in the new Unwinding Anxiety book, but the basic premise is I like to think about this from 
you know, our ancestors' terms. You know, what, what is it about our ancestors that helped them survive? And in fact, there's quite a bit of research that's pretty solid. You know, Eric Kendall got the Nobel Prize in the year 2000, showing that the process I'm about to describe was, is evolutionarily conserved all the way back to the sea slug, right? The, one of the most primitive, quote unquote, primitive nervous systems known in science. The basic process is called positive and negative reinforcement. And you can think of it as, you know, our ancient ancestors are, are out in the savannah looking for food, right? And so our, our brains don't have enough space to just to remember everything. So imagine our brain being like a camera and we don't just go out and take pictures of everything because we run out of space quickly. We have to selectively take pictures and our brains do the same thing. They only lay down memory when it's important. And there's a mechanism set up to do that. So the important things are you know, eating and not being eaten, right? Finding food and avoiding danger. So the positive reinforcement process actually happens pretty simply. There are three key elements, a trigger, a behavior, and a reward. So imagine we're out on the savanna, we find some food, there's the trigger, we eat the food, there's the behavior, and then our stomach sends this dopamine signal to our brain that says, remember what you ate and where you found it. So we take that snapshot so we lay down a context dependent memory, meaning, you know, we lay down so we can remember where the food is. We can go back there the next day. Remember, our ancestors didn't have refrigerators. You know, they didn't have fast food restaurants. They didn't have 24 hour diners. OK, same thing for danger. Trigger is you see the saber tooth tiger. The behavior is you run away. And then the reward is that you survive. But you also lay down that memory that says, oh, that's a dangerous part of the savanna. Be careful. Don't go there again. Right. So this positive and negative reinforcement process, evolutionarily conserved all the way back to the sea slug, this is how we learn basically every single habit that we have. And you can think of habit formation also being very helpful, right? Imagine having to relearn everything every day. We'd, we'd be exhausted by breakfast, you know, if we had to relearn how to walk and talk and make breakfast and make our coffee and, and all of that. So there's a, there's a real advantage to, I think I call it set and forget, right? Yeah. Set a habit, make that snapshot, remember, you know, where food is, remember what is rewarding, and then forget about the details so that we can free up our brain to learn new things. Yeah. And the interesting part here is the dopamine kick. You just said it, Dr. Judd, because the dopamine kick is something that um, is awfully satisfying short term. And that triggers a certain emotion, the reward. And we remember through that emotion that we say, oh, we did this. Dopamine kicks in. I feel better. So that is the kind of positive reinforcement, right? Absolutely. And the feeling better, I, I want to be clear about this because I think there are a lot of misconceptions about dopamine in the literature and in the, in the popular press. Dopamine is not a feel-good molecule, okay? So it, it's a molecule that's set up to help us learn, right? And so dopamine fires, we learn something, and then dopamine starts firing in anticipation of that behavior. So when we have a craving to do something, dopamine's there not to make us feel good, because if we felt good, we wouldn't need to do anything. It's there to get us off our butts to go get the food, or it's there to get us off our butts to get away from the danger. So there's this there's this restless quality of dopamine. You know, anytime we've had a craving for something, yep. we can say we can associate that with excitement, for example. But really, what it's doing is it's getting us, you know, riled up and revved up, and you know, we get all contracted to kind of spring to action. Yeah, and I, I think that is so interesting because we all talk about a dopamine dependency, especially when it comes to social media. Every time you look at your screen, you got a dopamine kick. All right, and that comes. And it goes and you go like, OK, and then you want another one. And I think this is a, the interesting line between where it is positive, positive reinforcement. You go, you find food, you have the dopamine kick, you remember where to go for food next time. But it can also turn vicious and against us. And this is something that we're seeing more and more in today's day and age where we are with an ancient brain, it seems, in a very new and very different environment. Well, in the very new different environment, for example, we you know we all have refrigerators. There's food, food is generally plentiful for most, you know, for a lot of the world, not all of it. But also social media companies know this system. You know, this has been studied, you know, largely since the 50s when B.F. Skinner became famous for his, you know, Skinner box where he outlined positive and negative reinforcement. 
So social media companies know exactly how this works. It's called intermittent reinforcement. The casinos, you know, gambling casinos know how it works. So they can use this, they can capitalize on it to get us addicted to everything from scrolling on our screens to, um, you know, giving people a bunch of likes on, you know, on a, on a YouTube video, for example. Yeah, absolutely. And now let's, let's try to link this kind of laying the land with your new book. Dr. Jett, you know, um, unwinding anxiety. I think anxiety, like depression, like burnout, it seems so, yeah, everybody has it. This is what we call it, a pandemic. But does do we really know what anxiety is? Uh, a, how do we define it? And how can I really tell I have it? What are the symptoms? So there's a definition that goes something like, you know, feeling of nervousness, worry, or unease, about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome. And I, I think it's interesting because if you look at the definition, the, that word worry can be both a noun, so this feeling of nervousness or unease, and it can also be a verb. I worry about something. Yeah. And there's a key ingredient there that I never knew about actually, that's really critical for, and the whole basis for why I wrote, why I wrote this whole book, so back when I was, you know, a, a while ago when I was starting to treat patients in my psychiatric clinic, the only tool I really had was medications, right? There were, you know, some people could get things like cognitive behavioral therapy and other, other talk therapies, but those, they're harder, it's harder to find somebody that's certified that's really good, you know, and it, and it takes time, et cetera. And the response rate to CBT, at least in the in the studies I've seen in the U.S., is about fifty percent. So you know, hit or miss. Mm. With with medications, there's this number needed to treat, meaning how many people you needed to treat before one person benefits. You can actually calculate this for any treatment, but with medications, it's five point one five, meaning that. I have to play the medication lottery. I have to treat five patients yes. before one of my patients shows a significant benefit or a significant decrease in symptoms. So you can imagine, you know, about 20% of my patients are benefiting from these anxiety medications. That's not very satisfying for me. You know, that's anxiety provoking for me. <laughs> and <laughs> right, okay. I'm anxious about my own work, the outcome. Right. No reward right. I want. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, so I started looking to see, you know, what else was out there. And at the time we'd been, my lab had been studying uh, an app that we developed for eating. So it's called eat right now. It was, it was mindfulness training to help people with, with overeating. And we had just gotten some pretty strong results. There was a study out of UCSF showing that, that we could get a 40% reduction in craving related eating. And one of the people in that program said that, you know, her trigger was anxiety for her to, to stress eat. And she said, you know, could you develop a program for anxiety? And I was thinking, you know, I generally prescribe medications, but as a researcher, some bell went off and I said, well, let me look at the literature to see what the mechanism is. You know, what do people know about anxiety? And back in the 80s, so this was decades and decades ago, this is ironically at the same time that benzodiazepines were at a very highly, heavily used. So even the Rolling Stones used to sing about them. You know, there's a song, Mother's Little Helper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, know, exactly. Goes running oh, to the oh, shelter. Oh, it. Oh, man. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So the benzodiazepines heavily used. They're not recommended as first line treatment for anxiety anymore. But the SSRI, so Prozac, was, you know, was first developed and then started being marketed in the 80s. So everybody was looking in the directions of medications. Yet these are the medications that where you have to treat five people before one person benefits. In that same period of time, there was a guy, Thomas Borkovec, who was studying anxiety. And he suggested that anxiety could be driven by worry as a negatively reinforced mental habit. And I was thinking, wow, this is crazy. I'd never thought about anxiety as a habit loop before, but I study habits. You know, I, I can help people quit smoking. I can help people stop overeating. Can we actually apply this to anxiety? So the way that it works is you can think of anxiety as that trigger, worry as the mental behavior. Behavior. A, a it, mental behavior. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the reward is tends to be something like a feeling of control or distraction. So it distracts us from the worst feeling, feeling of anxiety. 
Because, you know, imagine somebody that has, say, teenage kids, you know, and their kids go out at night to party. And the parents, they worry all night until they hear the doorknob open and then they can go to sleep. You know, they can immediately fall asleep. Well, I'm guessing their worrying didn't actually help their kids stay safe. Let me quickly interrupt the conversation to say thank you that you are here with me on the channel. If you do enjoy what I'm putting out, the in-depth kind of conversations, then why don't you subscribe and also hit the bell button so I can keep you informed with our newest releases. Thanks for that in advance. And let's get back to the conversation. That, that is an interesting, exactly. And, and that is so interesting and a super revelation for me when I read your book. Dr. Jad, I just said, wow. I mean, that worry is actually something like a cigarette I can do. And I have something to do because you write in your book, look, worry to worry doesn't bring a solution, which a behavior actually should come some sort of a reward based, uh, b b b based outcome. And it blocks your mind because worry is thought. And we can only think one thought at a time or one thought loop goes over and over again. So you have To recap, and if I understand it right, you have anxiety, which triggers all the questions, all the warpness, all my, you know, my thought loops, almost in a default mode. And then the outcome is I'm getting even more anxious because I've been warping myself in this loop, right? Yes, absolutely. Because the worry then starts to feed back and trigger more anxiety because it doesn't feel good. And then we start worrying, why am I more anxious? And then we go over that event horizon into the black hole of anxiety. Well, that is, you know what, that's an epiphany. And you must be so happy about your patient saying, hey, don't you have something against anxiety being the trigger? And that opens basically the, the entire, your entire book and a new chapter in psychology, psychiatry, if you look at it that way. Yes, but I wasn't ready to uh, be excited yet because as a scientist, I wanted to see if this stuff actually worked. So, you know, we had to develop and we developed an app also called Unwinding Anxiety. We did the clinical studies. We needed to make sure that it worked. So we, and I actually started with the first population that I thought would be really hard to work with, physicians, right? People like me. <laughs> <laughs> no. we, well, we tend, in medical school, we learn things like, you know, we have to armor up. We have to be the martyrs. You know, we have to do everything we can to take care of our patients and not worry about ourselves, right? And so there's also an epidemic of burnout right now in the healthcare profession, right? Physicians, other clinicians, et cetera, because we, we have this, this martyr syndrome. So I did a study with anxious physicians. We got a 57% reduction in these clinically validated anxiety scores in anxious physicians with this unwinding anxiety app. And we also found that there was a 50% reduction in callousness, this aspect of burnout. There was also a 20% reduction in emotional exhaustion. So here, treating things at the root cause, it's not like you know an app is going to fix all the systemic things that need to be fixed in, in medicine. But where there are personal things like individual aspects like callousness, it can help a lot with institutional things like uh, emotional exhaustion. It might help a little bit, but it's not going to fix, you know, it's not going to fix a system. So that was interesting, but it, it was a small study. It was, we didn't have a control group. So we did a second study with people with generalized anxiety disorder mm -hmm. and we got, are you ready for this? 67% reduction. In That's these amazing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And without a single drug as in drug, as in medicine? Without medication. So, but we could calculate the number needed to treat. And the number needed to treat in that study was 1.6. Amazing. Amazing. And how long was the time that you actually got to this result? How quickly did people's anxiety quieten down? We looked, the earliest we looked was about a month after people started using the Unwinding Anxiety app, and we had found significant reductions at one month. We saw more significant reductions at two, two months in our generalized anxiety disorder study and at three months in our physician study. Okay, so let's drill a little bit deeper into the actual technique. If anxiety is kind of a bad habit, then you are the specialist, you can break the habit. Before we go into this, Where is, where is the line between a bad habit and an actual addiction? Because one starts feeling normal always being anxious. One starts feeling normal every day to worry. One doesn't even know anymore that there is an 
you know, untoxic way of feeling where you actually feel good <laughs> and you feel calm. So where, where is the line? I like the simple definition that I learned in residency training of, of addiction, which is continued use despite adverse consequences. And I think that that was really helpful for me to see because this suggests that it's not just, you know, alcohol or cigarettes or cocaine or heroin or opioids, but it could be anything. You know, we could be uh, continuing to use our social media despite adverse consequences. We could be continuing to exercise despite adverse consequences where, you know, we, we get addicted to exercising and then we get injured, for example. Mm-hmm. So shopping, you know, you can just think of all of thinking, you know, I wrote in the craving mind how I was addicted to thinking. Yep. Yep. <laughs> you know? uh, so it's really anything, to, you know, that leads to adverse consequences because remember habits are helpful, right? They help us survive, but it's when it goes off, you know, down, I think of it as a continuum, you know, right? So at the far end of that spectrum, when they become, you know, continued use despite adverse consequences, that's when it becomes problematic. Yeah, exactly. So there is a a fine line to cross. Now, let's have a look at how to break that fine line, how to really deal with anxiety when you feel this is this is just not getting me anywhere. Um, What is your approach? What do what do you use? I highlight this, I kind of organized the Unwinding Anxiety book in three sections because of this. And this was, this actually came out of me observing. So I work with anybody that uses our apps. I run a live group every Wednesday at noon Eastern time for anybody in the world to join. And I'd been working, doing this for several years. And I started to see a pattern where people were starting to recognize their habit loops they were then starting to see how unrewarding the old behavior was. And then they brought, I could, I could help them bring in, or the app could help them bring in what we call a bigger, better offer. So let's unpack each of those. The, the habit loop is pretty straightforward. We've already, you and I have already discussed it. You know, what's the trigger? What's the behavior? What's the reward or the result? And in fact, this is so simple and so helpful for folks. We actually set up a website for anybody to download a free PDF where they can just, you know, they can just do map out their own habits. I think it's mapmyhabit.com. So if anybody wants to just map out their own habits, they can go to, you know, mapmyhabit.com and they can download a free habit mapper to be able to do this because it's basically about seeing, you know, what's the trigger, what's the behavior, what's the result. I mean, I can, I'll give you an example, actually, a concrete example of how this works. I have a clinic patient that I wrote a little bit about in the Unwinding Anxiety book who was referred to me for anxiety, right? So when he first, when he first walks into my office, I start taking his history and he was talking about how he would get very anxious driving on the highway. So I pulled out a piece of paper and mapped it out with him, literally on my desk, you know, th- took us 30 seconds. So his trigger was that he would feel, he felt like he was in a speeding bullet. That was the term he used, where he was, he started to have these thoughts where he might get in a car accident when he was on the highway. These were so distressing that he would start to get panic attacks. This led to him avoiding driving on the highway. So there was the behavior. And then the result was that he, you know, he could avoid those anxiety provoking situations. So we mapped out his habit loop in 30 seconds, right? It didn't take very long. And in fact, by the time he finished that, that first intake appointment with me, we, I, you know, he had pretty clear panic disorder as well as generalized anxiety disorder. And I sent him home. I sent him home with our Unwinding Anxiety app. And I said, just start mapping out your habit loops, set up a follow-up appointment for two weeks from then. So that's, that's step one. Anybody can follow that. Step two is really critical and a little more complicated. And I'll, so I'll follow the story of, of this gentleman to highlight this. So he comes back two weeks later. And the first thing he says to me, he says, oh, doc, I lost 14 pounds. Well, what I forgot to mention is that this gentleman also was about 80, 90 kilograms overweight, right? So he's about 180 pounds overweight. And I looked at him at that second visit because I was thinking, did we even talk about weight loss? Because we had you know, <laughs> it was like, covered so much great, ground. Double whammy. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. And he said, you know, I, I looked a little confused and he said, oh, doc, I was mapping out my habit loops. And I realized that anxiety was triggering me to stress eat. And then stress eating was, you know, was not helpful. Yep. And so I stopped doing it. So he lost 14 pounds. He went on to lose over 100 pounds, still, still losing weight as we speak. <laughs> you know? 
And this really highlights this second step. So I think of it as, you know, helping our brains update their reward value. Yeah. And that's, yeah. that's a critical piece because that's how our brains change behavior. It's not about the behavior itself. It's about how rewarding the behavior is. If it's still rewarding, we're going to keep doing it. If it's no longer rewarding, we're going to, it's going to be easier to stop doing it because we're less excited to do it. That's why I have my patients who smoke cigarettes pay attention as they smoke and they realize that smoking tastes like crap and then it's easy. To it stinks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and we've even studied this in my lab. So we embedded a tool in our Eat Right Now app where we could actually measure the reward value of somebody's behavior. So if they overeat or if they eat food that they, you know, that's not healthy for them, that they're trying to change eating, we have them pay attention as they eat. We have them pay attention to the results of that. And then what we can do is calculate how quickly that reward value changes. Well, it only takes about 10 to 15 times of somebody really truly paying attention and seeing how unrewarding something is for them to actually, for that reward value to drop below zero, meaning that they'll shift to not eating or not overeating that uh, whatever it is that they're overeating. So it's really neat to be able to see, you know, in using an app, we can study this and, and watch people's reward value change. So that's what the second step is, is really helping people see very, very clearly, not intellectually, not thinking, oh, smoking is bad for me, I should quit, but really tasting cigarettes or really seeing what it feels like to overeat or yep. really seeing what it feels like to worry. You know, does this worry fix the problem? Does it keep my family safe? And then feeling into their body and then checking in, well, is this actually making me more anxious? <laughs> Generally, the answer is yes. With anxiety, it's pretty straightforward because people, when they do the second step, they say, I don't, I don't think I'm getting anything from this. Yet it's critical for them to actually see that and articulate that, you know, where they say, oh, yeah, it really doesn't feel good. So they can line up that cause and effect relationship between the worrying and how unrewarding it is. Okay, and so that that's is, step two. That, that, if I may interject there, Dr. Jot, mm -hmm. is really the mindful mindfulness moment where I don't want to say objectivate because that means that whatever you're doing in the midst of things, which is maybe more the primal brain in action rather than the prefrontal cortex, is to say, hey, what is this really getting me? And being, mm -hmm. you use a lot curiosity, being curious about it and say, in that moment, I'm doing it very mindfully. I'm curious about what is happening. And in that way I can articulate it's not getting me anything it tastes like horrible it, it smells horrible you know I don't I don't like it and that really is enough to convince the brain that not doing it is better yes our brains need one thing to update reward value and that one thing is awareness but I think you're highlighting aspect it's not just being aware of something because we could be being, being aware of something and judging it and saying, oh, that's not true or this or that. It's really being aware without a filter, seeing things very, very clearly. And that's where the curiosity comes in, where we can say, oh, what am I getting from this? Am I getting anything from this? So we're truly open to learning in that moment rather than saying, oh, I know this is bad. I should stop. It's yeah. very different. But that's the only way that I'm aware of that we can actually update reward value is very, very clearly. And that comes through awareness. And the third step? The third step, I love this. I call it the BBO, the bigger, better offer, right? So our brains are always looking for this, what they'll do whatever is most rewarding. So why not find something more rewarding than, say, smoking a cigarette or overeating or worrying? And the nice thing about this step is that we can find things that are intrinsically rewarding so that they don't become habituated. So, for example, I have tons of patients, and this is actually happening. This has happened a lot in 2020, where some people have decreased their drinking of alcohol, for example, but a, a fair percentage of people have increased their, their alcohol intake. Others have increased their social media intake. Others have increased, you know, binge watching on Netflix. So there are all these compensatory behaviors that start to happen as a result of anxiety, of uncertainty, all of these things. So here, 
you know, we can we can't binge on Netflix forever. It's not going to fix it. It might help us distract ourselves from anxiety. We can't procrastinate forever. You know, it might it might distract us a little bit. You know, our house might be really clean or whatever. People that I, often people say, my house is really clean, but my work's not done. You know, <laughs> yeah. because they're at home and yeah. <laughs> they're distracting themselves by cleaning. Mm-hmm. So the the distraction things that are externally driven are we become habituated to them. You know, you can only eat so much. You can only watch so much Netflix. You can only clean your house so much. What we need to do is find things that are intrinsically rewarding, things that are always available because those don't become habituated. And this is where I love two things. One, curiosity. You already mentioned it. Mm -hmm. Where just getting curious. So curiosity is obviously something internal. And it's something we don't become habituated to. And when we have a craving for food or a cigarette or when we worry, we can actually get curious right in that moment. Oh, what does this worrying feel like in my body? What are the physical sensations that arise? Well, you tell me what feels better, being anxious and worried or curiosity? Now, curiosity, because yeah. it's, a, it's a growth mindset straight away. Yes, yes. So there's the bigger, better offer right there. You, you can think of anxiety as closing us down. And curiosity opens us up. And to learn, we have to be open. That's what growth mindset is all about. So here, curiosity is a great, bigger, better offer. And so is kindness. So I see a lot of self-judgment. Uh, these, are, these are kind of echo habit loops on top of overeating or anxiety or whatever. People say, you know, oh, I don't like what I, you know, what I, my physical appearance is, or they don't, you know, they say, oh, I'm, what's wrong with me? All of these things, they start judging themselves. That self-judgment also feels closed and contracted. So in those moments, we can bring in kindness toward yeah. ourselves, right? Or we could feel the kindness of others. And just feeling into that feeling, that true, genuine kindness, feel, it opens us up. And we can't be closed and open at the same time. They're, they're opposites. So the more we can touch into things that can even open us up for a little bit or open us up a little bit, right? Kindness and curiosity. The more we repeat those, the more our brains will see how rewarding they are. The more our brains will lean in that direction and we'll create those as our new habits. Now the self-kindness, let me, let me drill into that a little bit more if I may, because how difficult is it for your general patient for, you know, for, I don't want to generalize, but still, I wonder how easy it is for Joe Bloggs to really feel that kindness, that understanding, especially if they've been working against a bad habit or even an addiction over and over again, you know, tripping up, slipping up. This is what you say in your app. I go tripping up, slipping up, effing up, because that really completes kind of my picture. If I go, I go overboard. And then to feel uh, as an antidote, to this self-loathing or shame that you've broken again what you committed to, you know, to say, it's okay, <laughs> you're not so bad, you know, um, it's, you know, you will get there. I mean, that's really difficult, especially if you aspire or expect certain things from you. And that wraps up the first part of my conversation about anxiety together with Dr. Judson Brewer. And if you do like our conversations here on Mentory TV, why don't you subscribe for free? And so I can always keep you informed. If you hit that little bell button, you will know when I'm about to release the new video. Plus, thank you so much already for sharing and liking and most importantly, telling me what you think. What are your key takeaways?